doing a giveaway? You doing a giveaway? Hey everyone. There is quite a few seats up at the front. If you're looking for a seat, come on up to the front. We got a lot open. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you're just filtering in, come and grab a seat up in the front. Man, you guys are doing everything not to sit in the front <laughs> there. Uh, all right, so welcome to Deep Talks. This is Deep Talks Cat Mind Star for Underground. I am Erin Woodward with the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Uh, and Deep Talks is just our opportunity to bring the science that's happening deep underground at SURF into the community. And so we're really glad that you're here and we hope that you'll ask questions and be curious. And um, yeah, we're just really glad that, glad that you're here. Um, I want to take a second to thank the sponsors who make our Deep Talk series possible. We're sponsored by Crow Peak Brewing Company, RCS Construction, Northern Hills Federal Credit Union, Edward Jones, and Chuck and Jolene Lichten Walner. Uh, and if those names are starting to feel familiar, it's because we have had their support for years now. So let's give them a round of applause for supporting this. Um, and if you'd like to support this event or any of SURF's education and public outreach events, um, you can do so by getting in touch with the SURF Foundation Director, Michelle Kane. Uh, so tonight we're going to learn about the research that Caterpillar is doing deep underground at SURF. Uh, GPS has transformed the way humans navigate our world. But deep underground, those GPS signals go quiet. And this can make it very difficult for people who work underground in caves or mines or science labs to find their way. Um, so in an effort to replicate GPS deep underground, Cat built a test bed on the 1550 and 1700 levels of surf. And there's no active mining happening at SURF, but CAT's technology, which is called CAT MineStar for Underground, is changing the way that people and equipment can navigate in underground locations around the world. So tonight we're joined by Dan Pierce and Chris Gaynor. Uh, Dan Pierce is a graduate of South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and he has been in the mining, in mining industry for 18 years. He first joined CAT as a design engineer and is now a, the field operations manager for the MindStar for Underground Research Center at SURF. Uh, Chris is a graduate of Black Hills State University and he's worked at, he worked at Homestake Mining Company as a BH student in 1990 through 1994. And he's been with Caterpillar for 25 years and is now the business development manager for Underground Mining Technology and the Facility Manager for the MindStar for Underground Research Center. And that's a mouthful. If I got anything wrong, let me know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's give Chris and Dan a round of applause and welcome them up. All right, well, well thank you. I'm, I'm real excited to be here. I'm Chris Gaynor. Um, this is very exciting for me to be part of the, uh, the Merck facility. We call it Merck, MindStar for Underground Research Center. Um, I started back here in 97 with Caterpillar. I lived in Spearfish, worked out of that area, and I spent a lot of time up here. So it was a lot of fun to come back and reminisce with people and a lot of familiar faces as well. So, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. And I'll just turn a quick introduction for Dan. Yeah, so I'm Dan Pierce. I've uh, been with Caterpillar for 12 years now. Uh, still trying to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyways, i um, been in design engineering for probably the last... 11 and a half years. Um, so getting into the technology side, uh, really learning the MindStar system, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and I'm just gonna throw a quick video up here just to kind of do a quick introduction on some of Caterpillar's technology. Just about a four minute video. Sure, we make big yellow iron, and we're pretty good at it. And although you might not be in the market for a giant piece of earth moving equipment, you may want to consider what this nearly 100-year-old company has to say about technology. Why? Because of mining. Nearly every product you own, regardless of who makes it or what it does, would not exist as you know it without mining. And in the mining industry, CAT is the leading provider of big yellow mining machines and innovative technology, like autonomy. Caterpillar has been in the autonomy business for more than 30 years. 
and the results we've achieved aren't promises or forecasts. Our results are fleets of real machines doing real work on real mine sites all over the world. Really, no one is behind the wheel of CAT autonomous haul trucks, even when they're operating in the harshest environments on Earth. Plus, these trucks are big. The one you're looking at here is the CAT 797F autonomous haul truck. It's as large as a two and a half story, 3,000 square foot house and weighs 284.6 tons, empty. When it's fully loaded, the CAT 797F clocks in at an impressive 687 and one half tons, which is roughly the same weight as 15 standard 189 seat passenger planes. Since our autonomous mining trucks began operating commercially, they have now moved enough rock and earth to build a four lane dirt highway longer than the earth is round. That highway though, would be 15 feet tall and it's still growing. CAT autonomous trucks have now successfully moved billions of tons of material. That's right, with a B. That's enough to build a Hoover Dam over 3,000 times. So why does Caterpillar make autonomous vehicles? Because autonomy makes a big impact for customers who use it. It makes their mining operations more efficient. It cuts costs. It boosts productivity and profitability. But here's the stat our customers appreciate the most. CAT autonomous trucks have done all of that while working 24-7 on actual operating mine sites without a single lost time incident. Our technology leadership goes beyond autonomous trucks though. We provide solutions that automate dozers, drills, underground loaders, and even trains. And the list is growing all the time. We also provide advanced technology that helps mining companies better manage, deploy, maintain, and adapt their fleets of mobile equipment. And many of these help keep people safe by tracking people when they're deep underground, using cameras and radar to let machines know when another vehicle is nearby, and alerting machine operators if they start falling asleep. There are a lot of reasons why Caterpillar has become a successful innovator. We have a global team of talented software developers and researchers, computer engineers, and data analysts. Every day they are making discoveries and working on new groundbreaking technologies. And they're fully supported by our continued investment in research and development, which has paid off with a growing portfolio of patents and intellectual properties. We also create partnerships with other best-in-class technology providers who add to our strengths and help us get our tech into the market more quickly. But we could always use more. More partners, more people filling opportunities in Caterpillar locations all over the world, and more potential solutions for our customers and everyone else. The advancements we have made in mining are already being used in other industries, but we are committed to remaining at the forefront and discovering so much more. And that, for us, is a promise that carries a lot of weight. But can you picture 700 tons coming at you at probably 30, 40 miles an hour, nobody in it? It's pretty impressive, really. <laughs> it's been going, it's going we've, we've got trucks all over the world and it's very, very impressive. And, and it's amazing the adaption of technology that we've had in the mining industry. And again, it's all driving to produce at a lower cost, at a safer rate, um, be more productive. And again, at the end of the day, it comes down to lower commodity costs, right? We can come in and we can produce and we can deliver those commodities that, that you're all looking for. So just a quick, just so I kind of get an understanding of who's all here. Has anybody actually been in, in the underground mine? Has anybody been in underground? Oh, we've got a great, a lot of people. great group of people here. All right, and then I'm just always have always have one question. Is there, can anybody name something that you use every day that is driven from mining? Cell phones. Cell phones. Do you know how many materials are in a cell phone? Guess. <laughs> There's 30 different minerals in an iPhone. Oh, thank you. All right, <laughs> so that comes from all these different places, right? It has to be mined, it doesn't come from the store. You know, it doesn't come from down the street. It actually has to come from mining. Um, anybody have another example? My beer can. Your beer can? Yep, you do. Grab it. So They're feeding one. Better question. Can anyone tell me something that doesn't come from mining? Beer. Ah, oh. well, just a second. Let's talk about that. So how did you get to that? How did it turn into beer? Through a whole lot of processes that came from mining, right? Can anybody else name one? This is always the challenging bit. 
how did it extract from the cow? How did it get to the processing facility? How did it get to your store into the container and all that stuff, right? Everything around us today, toothpaste, seven, six or seven minerals that are mined, <coughs> toothpaste. So you can't escape mining, right? And it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger parts of our lives. Right now, we've got the transition of clean energy, right? So we're looking at battery transitions from our cars transitioning to batteries. It's 250 million cars in the US, just in the US. Probably 10, under 10% of those would be battery powered. So the transition is going to be huge. Look at the mineral requirements of vehicles. It takes 11 times the minerals to produce a battery electric car than it does to produce a conventional vehicle today. The same thing translates when it comes to generation power. If you're going to migrate away from coal, it's got to come from solar, it's got to come from wind, it's got to come from nuclear, it's got to come from somewhere, right? So you have to translate that. And it puts a lot of pressure on getting in and extracting the minerals, finding the minerals, and making sure that we can produce those at a cost-effective rate. Because we have to be joined very closely. And obviously, we are environmentalists too, right? We want to make sure we're doing the right thing, uh, producing at the right rate, doing it as clean, and looking after our environment. And so obviously, we're, we're going to be driving to produce the energy and the commodities that will help to produce that energy going forward. So this all translates as well back into underground, right? And I guess we're going to talk a little bit about underground because one of the challenges we have in underground is obviously we have a confined space and you see that big truck that's running 400 tons. You know, our individual machines might run seven tons. So we have to run very, very um, uh, cost effectively in order to compete with bulk material. Right? We want to make sure our, our underground customers are, are producing and are very competitive against their surface counterparts because copper is copper, gold is gold. Whether it's coming from surface or underground, um, it's still the same commodity. And we want to make sure that we're providing the, the technology that will help them advance. So this kind of brings us to why we're in here in South Dakota at SURF. Yep. So why are we at SURF? <clears throat> I, I kind of put this as a, a three-pillar solution. Um, sometimes it's four. But really, you know, customer and dealer experiences. You know, bringing customers in, showing them the technology. Um, dealers, bringing them in, introducing them to the technology so they can then go and provide solutions to their customers. Um, training. It's a very new pro pro product, excuse me. Um, but, you know, everyone needs to learn. And so um, bringing dealers in, bringing customers in, and actually hands-on showing them the technology. <clears throat> and then the kind of the third one is validation. So as this technology evolves, um, I've just spent the last four months of my life uh, constantly in a, in a state of validation. Um, you know, getting in uh, software from engineering, hey, we got the best place in the world to test it that's not customer facing. Um, getting it and Wyatt, you can attest to this. Um, you know, we bring that technology in, we run it through its paces, we find its flaws, and we just build on that and we make it better and better. And then the last one is as we go forward and we're, we're moving forward with, with the technology, um, call it the MGPP plan, but future generations, how do we test that? And we're kind of developing that process now. Um, you know, for that future state, you know, what are our procedures, what are our requirements to make this better and better as we go forward? Yeah, and we've got many of our, our engineering partners are in Australia and different areas of the world, and we can be testing while they're sleeping. Um, we can send the validation <coughs> information back while they, they're awake and they can be going through that while we're sleeping. So one of the real goals here was to accelerate the pace in which we are developing technology for underground. and. Uh, uh, get this into the market as quickly as we can, and again, and, and, and slowly develop out into, again, what you saw with, with uh, the large mining trucks into, you know, again, the world of full autonomy. People being able to operate around um, autonomous machines, machines interacting with each other, and, and being able to uh, uh, drive those efficiencies as we go forward. So one of the things, kind of the early days, and one of the drivers of this is, you know, I worked at Homestake, and my dad and I actually had to do some production studies down there. And it was uh, 120 degrees. It was incredible. That's me. <laughs> Very close to the same, right? 
So, so you'll recognize, maybe some people will recognize the people in there. But you know, the typical process, we'd brass in. So we'd go in and we have this tag and we have to hang it on the board. We get in line and we wait. We get in the cage, or if you want to think of it as an elevator, right? So we get in the cage, we drop down 4,800 feet, get in a train, cruise across, go down the four winds, drop down to the 7,400 foot level, and phew, it's hot, right? And then we get out and we all go take the train again to a maintenance area. So we got the shop on the 7,400 and we sit around and we get our, our tasks for the day. Everybody's in getting their task, you're gonna go dig in this area and gonna go put it down this ore pass and you're gonna go dig and you're gonna do these, right? And so then everybody goes off. And at the end of the day, you all come back and most people had handwritten, you know, handwritten uh, production information and they're handing it to the boss and, you know, heaven forbid you'd have to read my handwriting back then and all the dirt and grease on your hands and interpret that data, right? And you hand it back and you set it down and then someone has to take that, enter it into the system and come up with real data, right? So there's lots of opportunity for error. Did you really take 50 buckets? Man, that was a good, good run. Or did you kind of lose track and add a couple because you thought you forgot a couple? And, and, or did you forget a bunch, right? Oh so, God, it's just that good. yeah, see? <laughs> it's a, you know, but, but there was really no way of knowing what happened. What came out at the end of the day was, was what come out the skips is kind of what got measured. In underground, it was really about, you know, how do we get it? to the K, how do we get it to the, sh the shaft so we can skip it out and get it to the crusher? And then when you start thinking about how do we improve efficiencies? Well, how do you identify what was wrong? You know, it was really challenging. It always comes back, it's what I think. And so when we would do this production study, and this is the actual document that I, I grabbed from many years ago, and it was manual, right? It was, you grab six people, and you divided it up and you synchronized your watches to get the seconds right and three people would go to the bottom and three people would go to the top and this is just kind of a little graphic, it's about 1,500 feet. S some people would be here, some people here. And you're manually stop watching. This is when it's coming and we're writing it all this stuff down, right? And at the end you consolidate it, you have to make it work and it, it kind of, it works, but it's a lot of work. And it took us a whole day to do 1,500 feet. And there's what, 300 and 50 miles of productive opportunities down there. So it's gonna take a lot of work, right? So the question kind of comes is, what if you can capture all that information in real time? What if you know exactly where you took the bucket? What if you know exactly where you dumped it? How much was in there? How much went down there? Where it came from? So you can track the grade and do all the things you need to do to manage, and manage the mine. How would you know if you're falling behind and you need to dispatch someone over to this area to help so that you can get the additional production. On a pit, you stand on the side, you can see the machines running and you can see it all moving. Underground, it's really the trust of the people, right? And so now it's all about trying to get this data. And so what we're testing here is really two areas. We've got what we call our detect product. And did anybody have a chance to see our detect display out here? And if you haven't, and you want to go have a look at it afterwards, we've got a bit of time. We can kind of show you it's set up. We can show you what that's all about. We'll have some videos to explain it here too. But um, so what it's really doing is it's something, it's two nodes or two items mounted on the machine that is sending out a signal and you've got, and it can send a signal to another machine or it can send a signal to uh, a personnel node that's on a person. And so when they interact, they're going to be notified. All right. So one will, if a truck's coming, it'll notify by honking and alarms and all this stuff. And so you're gonna be knowing that there's a vehicle coming or two vehicles are coming around a blind corner. They'll know well in advance that they're coming. So <coughs> they can avoid colli colliding to each other. And so we've got what we call situational awareness, right? I know if things are happening, I can intervene before the, the, the um, interaction happens. And then what we call, we have also down on, down on the 1700 what we call fleet. All right, so this is now taking what we just talked about, about detect, and it's now putting a, a, a radio network in underground, which acts similar to a GPS, which is now fixating the coordinates of the machines and the people. So when you think about, I, I always like to compare it to, you know, the old ant farms, right? Back when I was a kid, you used to see these little ant farms, and you'd see the little tunnels that they all had. Well, it's kind of like getting visibility to the ant farm, right? You can see all the people, you can see all the machines, you can see them all moving around in real time. 
right? So you know exactly where one person is, you know exactly where that machine is, and you can see what's happening, and you can track. And so we'll go through and we'll kind of show you some examples of, of each of those. So when you think of, this is what we've got on display out here. So again, if you want to have a look at it, we certainly can go through that. So this is what we call detect. And, and uh, Wyatt, our lovely assistant here, was wearing the personnel node. I think I put one over here if you wanted to pass yeah. it up. You want to pass it around? Yeah, you can pass that around if you like. Um, so this personnel node is on your belt. You can't turn it off. So as soon as you check it out, it's got your name on it. You put it on your belt, and it's you for the day. So you'll wear that, and basically what that's going to do is, is um, aware, alert any machine that's coming around that you're there. And it's also going to alert you that they're there. And then also inside the machine, we've got what we call our VPC, or our vehicle PC, right? It's going to show you a map once we get to, it, once we get to the, the MindStar side and the fleet side, you'll see a map. But what it'll also do is it'll show anybody as they approach. So if you were driving this vehicle and you approached, you approached Wyatt, and this mode he had his node K K Casey, so you, you can see automatically it lights up. The alarms go off, it starts buzzing, and you can't really ignore it, right? You can, you can feel it, you can see it. The operator here will say, Casey's 10 meters away, straight in front of you, right? So be aware. And it'll actually start to notify them well in advance of that. So you can configure that to however you like. So if you're going really fast, you might want to make it longer. If you're going really slow, we're, we happen to go pretty slow around where we're at just for testing, and we like to make it shorter so we're not sending off the signal all the time. But what we can do is it'll, it'll alert. So the operator actually gets an alert way before it gets red. So it'll, it'll come out and it'll actually start out green and go to yellow, and then it goes into red. And I'll show you an example of that video right here. Ooh, that's really dark. All right, so this is actually in our what we call Harding Station, and this is where we park all our vehicles. And you can see right now at 39 meters, it's already telling the operator there's a person around the corner, right? So we're going around the corner. Now it's going into yellow. It's saying, now be a little more cautious, take, take alert. And now you can see the, the belt is already lit, lit up. <coughs> the person's aware that they're coming around the corner and they can take, you know, evasive action to move. And then some of the other areas, and I just put this other little video on the side, you know, not always is it somebody standing in a road and walking down a roadway. It's someone who might be doing something, right? They might, anyone have, you know, listen to your music 24 seven now? Might have your earbuds in, <coughs> working in an electrical panel, like, like why it was there, oblivious to what's coming around you, and all of a sudden you start to feel this vibration and the lights start flashing, right? And the alarms start going off. Now you're aware that there's a actual vehicle that's gonna be coming passing by right behind you. So it just alerts him, he can close off, step aside, Acknowledge it and then go back to work. Okay. Yep. So then we kind of move it. So what Chris just showed was detect, and that I, I call that kind of our first building block. Um, you know, to move on from that, then you put in some infrastructure and you put in some access points. Um, so you can see our our uh, we call them WASP, um, but our access points, um, and then bridge nodes, which are right here, and we kind of build an underground network. <clears throat> and that that, that kind of opens up a lot more things. Um, you know, not only do do you still get the benefits of detect, but now you're getting um, benefits of of locating assets in real time anywhere in your your mind site or your development. <clears throat> so you can kind of see how we have them set up. This is uh, a photo of the 1700 level. Um, you can see. We've got uh, an access point, and then a little bit farther down the drift, you can see another access point. We'll go to the next one. <clears throat> so, with that, with that active tracking, um, it, like I said, it, it kind of opens up a lot of different possibilities. Um, one of the suites within MindStar is Tagboard. So, Chris kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, you start your shift at the beginning of the morning or in the evening, however that works out. But you walk in, and first thing you do before you get on the cage, you brass in. And that tells everyone at the mine site if there's um, an evacuation or there's an emergency, whether it's a drill or real, that 
hey, I've got 144 people underground. Um, that's your checks and balance system. Well, so if you're mine rescue, what does that actually tell you? Anyone? Will? Right. But what's the big oh, question? Where are they? Exactly. So, I'm going to click that one more time. Yeah. Which one? Right one. All right. Maybe. Oh, boy. <laughs> I broke it. There's a couple. All right. You giggled. There you go. You know. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> so, anyways, we'll get this blown up here in a second. Um, <laughs> But now we're, we've kind of introduced a, uh, a live, don't give me that anymore. <laughs> a live or guy. a virtual <laughs> tag board. Um, so not only do we know how many people are underground, but what level are they on? You know, do we have 39 people at the 4850? Do we have seven people uh, on the 1700? Um, and people move around day to day. Uh, I work with some some crazy guys, the UMC folks, they're bouncing around levels all day long. And so from whether it be a drill or an actual emergency, where do we gotta go to get people out? And how efficiently do we do it? Um, and, and, and what's interesting here as well is when you think about you know, having two shafts, right? They kind of connect and some can evacuate. When it's an emergency evacuation, you can go down the Ross and you come out the Yates and you go out the Yates and come out the Ross and this would automatically do the checks and balance for you to know that all these people are actually accounted for. They might be at their, the Yates, you know, and they tagged in at the Ross, right? But you can see all the checks and balances of where they're coming out and that they're out, they're out safely. And those that may be in other areas, you know exactly where to start, right? So, do you want and so Yeah, okay. so this is kind of a live demonstration. Once again, this is the 1700 level. And you can see tag board on the left. Um, mine view, which is the active mine map on the right. So we, we do have active tra tracking uh, on our level. Um, but our command center is kind of where all the people are located. That's where our computers are at. That's where we have lunch. Um, but you just saw Vasquez walk out of the command center. Um, and you see Lohan down here in, in Harding Station. So this is Harding Station. And this little block right here is our refuge chamber. You know, so if there was an evacuation that we couldn't get out, that's where we're going to go. That's where we want Mine Rescue to look for us. Yep. You can see Vasquez is about to enter into Harding Station and will move yep. in from being on the level to clocking into the Harding Station once they get around the corner and they're, they're registered in. We want to know where all our vehicles are. We want to know where the people are in those areas. And so we want to make sure we track that spot. And so you'll see very shortly that Vasquez will enter. So there you go. Yep. And it'll tell you exactly the time that they entered into that area. Great. And you also see our, our truck, TK547. He's going to pull into Harding Station. Um, you'll see the, the asset also show up into that tag board zone. Um, and then as we, as we get people that are leaving the command center and, and they're going other places, you can see that active checking in, checking out. Um, and we also get to check and see who sits in there for lunch a little too long. Yeah. <laughs> right? All of that gets recorded. It's really amazing. It all gets recorded behind the scenes, right? So we know exactly when you checked in for the command center. We know exactly when you left the command center. We know how long you spent in Harding Station. We know if you went and took a nap in, in the refuge chamber, right? Yep. So, and, but we also know all the activities you've done. We knew exactly how much you produced for that day. We could compare in, in an area. If one person's producing in this area and the next person's doing it the next day, we can compare the two. We also can understand what might have been the challenge between, between one and the other of people getting in the way, delays. We record all of it, right? So there's a lot of data that can be used in this. And you can see, we can just, you'll see people just bouncing in and out. And you can see that anywhere. So you can see it on the surface. You can see it in the underground workshop. Um, it's all visible. And this was an example of when we Ah, Vasquez. Vasquez is, oh, let's put Vasquez too quiet. I, I called him out for too long a to lunch. Yep. Um, so this is an example of the other half. So our command center was down here, and we just took a snapshot of the other half to show the other equipment and people moving around. 
So you can see we've got a truck 547's going, we've got a cast member that's here, we've got people and machines working here, we've got a loader that's been digging. Our loaders are not loaders, all right? So what we've got is we have cat utility vehicles, so the stuff you kind of like a, um, you see running down the, the, yep. the back areas of, of the hills these days. Side by side. Side by side, so we've got those. Okay, so we label them loader because we're actively working. We can, we can put it on anything. We put it on a wheelbarrow. We can put it on a fuel truck. We Shopping can put it cart. on about anything. So we can label it and we know exactly what that particular unit is as it's moving through the operation, right? So if there's things in there that you really wanna have, keep track of, we can, we can put a personnel or a, a, a machine node on there and we can track that machine anywhere throughout the mine it goes. And so, as you can see, we see these loaders are cycling. We've got another loader that's in the w in moving in there. We've got a truck going back. So every time a loader would move into a, um, a dump area, it would record the time that it dumped. And if it had payload monitoring systems on it, it would actually tell how much material it hauled into that area. And then when it went to the next area. And they're all given assignments. So they can look on their screen and they know exactly how many buckets they're supposed to take from this area and they know how many buckets they're supposed to dump in this area. So they can go in and, and know, and, and there's a check and balance to it, right? So we know that you're supposed to take five, but you took 10. Uh, because it was easier digging in this particular area you were supposed to dig, had big rocks, it was hard to dig, so you skipped it, and you're gonna leave, it, leave that for the guy on the next shift, right? <laughs> so it looks like you did better, right? <laughs> so, so it's all of those things, right? And so we can have a look at the compliance to plan. We can have a look at how they're performing and, and have it all in real time and extrapolate that data. And the data can come out in all kinds of forms, right? So it's really about how you wanna look at it, how you wanna extrapolate it, and what you wanna see. Um, and from there on out, you can make a lot of decisions on how to improve your operation, you know, what, what things you might wanna uh, deploy, maybe traffic management programs, um, in order to make sure that they can keep those uh, productivity of those machines up. Get a good insight on where road maintenance is happening, where you're having issues. Um, gives a, a real quick visual on where your inefficiencies are and you start capitalizing on that low hanging fruit. Okay, all of a sudden, you know, day two, you're a lot more efficient. Okay, you look at the data, you can still see exactly where your inefficiencies are. And you know, if you got four crews working underground, you're the supervisor, whatever it is, okay, you know, A, B, and D are doing really good. What's going on with operator C? Did you have a bad day last night? You know, is his machine you know, running in regen all the time? Is he having a maintenance issue? Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that are going on. And we didn't really allude to this earlier, but you know, in the old days, you'd, you'd ride the cage down at shift change and you just got a few minutes, you know, and in passing to figure out what the other crew did the day before and you know, if there was issues, uh, did you have machines down, where are the machines at? And now we've got tracking of assets. Um, you can tell people coming in and out of the mine and then you've got all the data to, to show you where you need to improve um, for your shift. So as a supervisor sitting underground, you can go through, okay, you know, uh, Chris, you use the analogy all the time of the world record, um, if you guys watch the Olympics, the world record line as these guys are swimming down the pool, right? And you know, you can see at a moment's notice, are you above the curve? Are you at the curve or are you below the curve? And what you gotta do to hit the curve because that's your target for the day. So we've got, a, we've got a lot of, this is where we're putting a lot of our time. We're putting a lot of time in, in developing you know, the interfaces with this, a lot of time in, in making sure that we are, are capturing the data that we're, we're intending to capture. And probably one of the, the biggest reasons that we put here as well is what we call our customer experience. Is we wanted to be able to bring customers into an operation, again, a non we not have to impact the mine and their productivity. We wanted to come into a real mine, bring them into a real environment, and being able to go and demonstrate and display our technologies. And so this is just a couple of, we had, last year we, start, we kicked off our, 
our customer experiences last year. Um, and we had a fantastic turnout. We've already, we're already starting it again. Uh, we're going to start up again in April um, and have a lot of, it, uh, of interest. And we've, we've not only showcased, you know, surf and our technologies, but also obviously South Dakota and all the things South Dakota offers. But what, is, what was a lot of fun is, you know, they're coming from everywhere. We've had Australia, Ghana, Chile, Peru, Mexico, U.S., Australia. Canada. Canada. I uh, can't think of any third and I'm sorry if I missed a country for the US. those that might have come. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we've been very busy hosting a, a lot of people, and it's, and it's fantastic because everybody comes with a different perspective. Everyone comes with a different challenge, right? And we're learning a lot from the customer visits, and they're taking away some things that you know, we hope to apply in their operations and, and improve whether it's the safety or productivity of their equipment and their site. So we left a little time. How much time do we have? Okay, so we were about seven minutes longer. Than you talk too fast, Chris. <laughs> I can slow down, but I have a lot more to talk about. But, <laughs> but we left a little time for questions, if you had any questions about it. What's the time period before all this is uh, implemented? We, have, we are selling it. So we, are de we have a few mine sites already that we're deploying these. Um, and again, our, what we're looking at is kind of generation two and generation three. So we're looking at what we're going to do for the next generations of this facility. So what we do, uh, we're automatically, we're right now we're already implementing some sites. Come back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, when will this be ready um, uh, to deploy it at other operations? And, and the answer is we, we are currently actively yeah, selling yeah, it and deploying it today. Yes, yeah. sir. So um, on the science side of things, further underground, there are some applications where it'd be really nice to know your exact um, for some of the detectors that we have. So, uh, how, so as you map out the underground on your level, um, is it calibrated to the surface somehow? Correct. The shaft or how yep. Yep. So everything with the MindStar deployment is based on ESPG coordinates. Um, but basically you've got an XY0 on surface. And then your, all your development work underneath is all spec to 000. zero, zero. So Davis Campus, for instance, um, you know, on the Yates side, we're actively working on deploying that and actually going to um, active personnel tracking on the 4850. Yeah. So phase one was getting the locations on, on level, and phase two is going to be active tracking on the Davis Campus. Yeah, so, so I, I can't name all the customers. Basically, we've got a lot of big organizations in, in the underground mining space. There's probably uh, 1,500 different mines in the world that are, that are actively mining. So we've got a lot of opportunity there. And so a lot of these, these customers that are coming are looking for areas in which they can start to capture data. Believe it or not, data is a driver in this. They want to know what's happening down there. Yep. And so they want to be able to figure out, like, Surface has been doing it for years, right? They're down to the, the pennies and they know the cycles and they're you know, managing and shaving off 10 seconds, right? In underground, it's been always been kind of a mystery because we've never been able to capture that level of data. And then with, what comes with it is the decision factors, right? So, so when it comes to the MindStar fleet, it's, it's really about data. Uh, when it comes to detect, it's just solely safety. Yep. Um, you know, they may have had an incident where they've had a machine around, coming around a corner. And you can imagine, you know, if you just kind of going through that door and someone coming down this hallway, but you're taking that corner at, you know, 10 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour, you know, not knowing what's around that corner. And so in underground, you're, you're either using radios or your, your lights, right? So you're, you can see lights shining against a rock, and you, so you really got to be aware. Well, this will tell you, you know, 50 meters in advance that that vehicle's coming. And they can just, you know, you can radio them and they'll say, nope, I'm pulled off. You can go ahead and go by. So the, the efficiencies you can gain as well by having them seeing you coming. You can see them on the map. You can pull over quickly if you're empty and let the, the full haul truck go by or the loader go by and then go back in so you're really not impacting production. <coughs> so there's, I don't know, there's no, probably not one, one single reason, but you can see some of the real key, key things for that. Yes, yes sir. Uh, 
It sends back to the hub and redistributes the information. So everything that we collect underground all comes to uh, a server. Now that server might be on surface, it might be you know underground or whatever, but it comes back to a server and then goes back out. I think referring to detect though. Detect, so detect is a little different. So the safety um, doesn't have to cascade back. Detect is between, so you were at the station or demo out here earlier. That mobile node and the personnel node, we call that a peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and that's direct. That's, you know, my cell phone calling your cell phone. Um, it doesn't go back to surface. What is the range of those? Uh, 100 meters, okay. safely. That, that better be careful he's going to show his GMC commercial yeah. in a second. <laughs> no, I, yeah, in, in saying that, you know, if you think about five years ago on the surface, right, how many people saw the Tesla driving with the person reading the book and the outrage, it was on national television, the outrage that came of it and the recent GMC ad where they're doing the driving with the family in the car and a boat behind it down the highway, right? I mean, now we're like, that's cool. But before it was like, that's terrible. I can't believe how, t how would anyone would do that, right? Um, so we're adapting to technology so fast. And in the underground space, we've had, we've had um, command for underground. We didn't get into that here because we don't have it up at SURF, but we do have it in our Tanaha Hills facility. And command for underground is our semi-autonomous and autonomous versions of, of loaders. So, but, it, but today it can't work around people and it can't work in amongst other, other live vehicles. So really it's now taking that and moving it and integrating it into live people interactions and uh, other support equipment and those types of things. Yeah. Well. I just wanted to ask a question so I get a free hat. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that much. Yeah, could you go ahead and uh, give the gentleman in the back a free hat? <laughs> yes. I didn't I didn't hear a question, Will. I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's a change management process, obviously, that's, that's required to do that. And we do have a change management team that kind of comes in and helps with, with that. Um, you know, when we first started, and in, 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 you know, again, everyone's, everyone's adaption of technology is coming on quickly, right? So a lot of people don't really deem it as a, a negative. They look at it as a positive. It's a safety feature, right? So, this feature is going to keep me from getting run into by a vehicle that I may or may not see coming, right? And people's, um, what do I want to say, the acceptance of, of a little bit of that watching, right, versus the, the benefits of the safety that comes of it are, are greatly outweighed. And so a lot of people are just adapting that. We used to have the same thing with what we call our driver safety system, our fatigue monitoring system. It was a camera facing the operator inside the cab. And when you fall asleep, it'd buzz your seat, and wake you up, and send the video to a dispatch to see if you really fell asleep, right? And it wasn't to penalize you to fall asleep. It's, I'm going to take interactions, and I'm going to let you get out of the vehicle. Maybe we're going to have a conversation and say, hey, how are you feeling? You feeling all right? Yeah, do you need a break? No? Okay, well, you just fell asleep 15 minutes later. Okay, come on, let's go take a break. We're going to park the truck to the side for your safety. And at the beginning, they used to rub stuff on the cameras, and they used to put their hat on it, and we could always tell when they did it, right? <laughs> but in the end, now they're like, if that's not working, I'm not running, yeah. right? I'm not going to do it because it's a safety feature, and it has saved a lot of people's lives um, when you think you're falling asleep, and everyone's done it on the highway, right? When you do this, right, going down the road, that's not you falling asleep. That's you waking up. You don't know when you fell asleep. So we've got some incredible videos of that. So all of this stuff is getting is getting more and more accepted. And I think, again, it's just that the resistance to acceptance of technology is going down further and further. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say um, I'm a huge fan of the technology. We've been around it you know, a few years 
now. Um, the biggest advantage I see for us right now is we kind of just, you know, we have an emergency thing. Is anything else going on for us? My question really is for Wyatt. I'd like him to <laughs> Excellent. Be front. Yes. <laughs> be more front. Yeah, so Wyatt, 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 Wyatt's part Wyatt, of our team. I really like the 15 because it's a little cooler to nap. <laughs> oh, that's wrong. But we got him on. We got him recorded, so we do know that he's doing it. So I was just going to say, from an asset management part too, when you've got uh, mobile underground fuel tanks and the different different equipment and fire loads, you know where those are at. Yep. And if you're in a, an underground fire situation or evacuation, you know where to direct people around yep. those. Yep. So it's interesting you bring that up because we had a customer last year and one of their big questions was, you know, whether it's, you know, they're bringing a new machine underground or they've got a piece of equipment. How do they keep that from getting damaged? Because everything's pretty close quarters underground. And we can we're actually go. Too, yeah. So it's get damaged. Yep. <laughs> yep. But you can actually put a mobile node on that and locate, I'll call it an asset, um, whether it's a piece of equipment or part of a piece of equipment and keep it safe. Fuel tank, um, I know I've talked to, to Bryce with Surf, you know, where are our fuel tanks? Um, what level are they on? And this is a perfect tool for knowing where those assets are at. Yes, sir. Maybe he wants to know when you guys are gonna start serving pit passing on the customer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll name the kitchen. How's that? Hey, that's great. Hey, so we do, we do, tasty. yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. See, and it, it all comes back to mining, right? No, we do serve, all our customers come back and we get King's pasties and we bring them down, we have an oven and we, we give them a little local flavor as well, so. Yes. Uh, how, oh, go ahead. You're, oh, how spread out can those lost nodes be? Is it like every 50 feet in the drift or is it more every year? About every 300 feet. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So a lot of that's dependent on the geometry, but <coughs> if you're in a straightaway, 300 feet. Do you, do you want a hat? <laughs> of course she wants a hat. <laughs> yeah, there she is. There, all the way back there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I saw another hand come up back here. Yep. So the, the question was, is what happens when a component fails on a machine um, that may be autonomous? Um, will the machine continue to keep going or what happens to that particular machine? And so like in the underground space, we call it fail to safe. So if one of those components fails, it automatically applies a park brake and the machine will shut down. So it's, there's, we've got all th at three different levels of warning as those machines go through. In the underground space, we also have barriers um, as you go in and out of those areas, they're locked out. So a machine is kind of captive in those areas and there's another safety barrier, there's actually two safety barriers there. There's a lanyard and, a, and, a, and what we would call a, um, a shield. So curtain. it's like a laser curtain yep. that's there. So if it ever hits that barrier, machine gets shut down, the system all shuts down. If it ever hits that curtain, it shuts down as well. So we've got a lot of system um, to, to monitor to make sure that we don't want to have one go rogue. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, can I take a picture of the Chamber of Commerce facing this area real quick? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hands up there. I figured I needed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no so problem. Much better with now, yeah. now, I, now I need a speech. So, so do you want the back of our heads? <laughs> <laughs> an, an action <laughs> shot? <laughs> no, no backs. No backs. Oh, no oh. backs. It's our best side. Everybody stand. Sit down. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, we're just gonna zoom in it. 
Thank you. You bet. <laughs> and I wanted a hat, too. Oh, <laughs> you'll have to see Wyatt. Wyatt is the hat policeman over there. Yes, sir. We, if you are in an active area, you also do have, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is our communication, so you can actually call. So you have cell phone coverage down there, you can actually make a phone call. But we also have a button, if you hold that button down, the alarms will come on, and it's called a find me, or notify me. Broadcast me. Broadcast me, and so anyone in those areas will see that you've hit that broadcast button, and you're able to then come up on their screen and they'll see you there. Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so so we've got some partnerships. We call the Mine Site Mining Collaboration Center. Um, so we formed with uh, agreements of a lot of our technology customers, and we've also had some programs with South Dakota School of Mines and Western Dakota Votech. And so I'll start with Western Dakota Votech, as we have developed a curriculum in conjunction with Western D Dakota Votech for the uh, autonomous uh, technician, right? So. We know that there's gonna be some requirements for technical um, and both on the machine side as well as on the technology side of being able to have service technicians. And it's gonna be a fantastic industry. Um, and so we've, we've partnered with them to develop a curriculum to start to develop the talent to start to fill our dealerships and also Caterpillar, right? And our customers with, with skilled people that understand the technology and understand how that plays with the machine. So then the second, we've got, a, we've got a program with South Dakota School of Mines as well, which our, mine site, our Mining Collaboration Center partners uh, contribute into as well, where we can focus on finding projects to solve for those customers specifically in the technology area. So we, we have people from undergraduate all the way to professor, professor level working in these programs um, in conjunction as well with a lot of our, and Ken's here, he runs the MCC in the far <laughs> back, but, but in conjunction with our Caterpillar resources, right? And we're, we're solving real problems, providing real applications for students and, and uh, being able to apply that solution in the underground environments. So we've got some partners with Pete Lean and Sons, uh, uh, Wharf, and the Sanford Lab are all three partners where we're, we've, got some, we've got agreements where we can come in and showcase technologies that are available, but also focus on solving some of these problems through our other partners in the schools. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So this equipment, you showed videos before that just showed standard equipment that still had manual controls and everything mm -hmm. was done. Is there something that plugs into an assembly line data link or something that, that allows it to be somewhat autonomous? Or, or are they built out? They're equipped, yeah. So they'll, there's a lot of interfaces and things that need to be put on machines. Like in the underground space, we'll have an interface. Um, we'll also have what we call laser LADARs. It's a kind of a laser radar um, that scans. And uh, it scans out front about a certain level. And what it's doing is it's scanning the walls. So it would, in a split second, know exactly what's in this room, all the contours of this room. And it will work to stay inside the, the profile of that so it's not being damaged. And so it has one on the front and one in the back. And that machine would then run. And it's communicating through a radio network up to a control station, um, whether that's on the surface, whether that's in this room. Um, you know, we can run machines in Tanaha Hills. I think the guys were running a dozer in, uh, from Butler Machinery uh, down in Tanaha last week. Um, so, you know, as long as you've got the connectivity, um, you can run it from just about anywhere. So again, and you start to take a look at what does that mean, right? How do you get people to go move in the middle of, of what they would deem to be nowhere, right? Um, when your populations are in the major hubs, well, you can set up a control center in the major hub operating those equipment in, in those hard to reach places. So, you know, from a cost perspective, fly in, fly out gets reduced, global footprint, you know, all of that stuff, right, gets, gets, gets taken down with not having to send so many people to these sites um, and you're able to then, you know, react and, and have your, your um, uh, employee base, right, and a lot more people to draw from in, the, in those areas. challenges of implementing mine stuff that we might not know about? 
<laughs> the major challenges, obviously, is going to change management is going to be one. And obviously, when we talk about the, the network, you know, so we're going to obviously have to come in and run the, the lines and, and do the, the construction and, and I guess you want to call it installation and deployment of the network itself. Um, so those are kind of right out of the gate or probably, you know, and, and obviously the costs associated with networks. Um, but a lot of the oper and a lot of operations now are putting them in. So this is a, you know, they're all, they're all kind of, it's all that transitions coming in at the right time where you can put a network in that can get you to the future. And hopefully that network's got the bandwidth to get you from, you know, where you want to be tomorrow where, to actually where you want to be in, you know, 15, 20 years time. But it, it's going to be, you know, network installation and, and network. That is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the big thing is that server on Surface or wherever it's at can't lose power. And so whether that's uh, a UPC or that's a backup generator, um, and, and that's, that's one of the things that we're actively working on right now is how do you cache that information um, you know, on, on a database server so that, okay, if it does crash, you can still pull up and know that there's 143 people underground. Um, but it, as it stands today, it's uh, backup, backup power, power and uh, power generation. And if anyone's looking for backup power, we do have a power generation division. <laughs> <laughs> Plug that. So That's right, I got it, sorry. We, we have the solution to that. Yes, sir. Right, so I would say overall from a, a personnel or labor standpoint, you're, you're maybe talking one extra person to run the MindStar program, um, but that could very easily be somebody from dispatch. Anyways, um, we call them a controller, but uh, you know, dispatch could act as that controller as well. Yes, we have one more. Besides the school programs, um, I, I mean, if, if you look at it, the extended Caterpillar, we've actually got a, a design center that's based in uh, Rapid City as well. And Ken, how many, roughly how many people we've got in there? There's 80. There's 80 people, so we have about 80 people that we have in the design center um, that are doing engineering work. They used to do engineering work when I lived in Australia. They did engineering work with, for our division. Um, they're doing a lot of technical development. And also, you know, again, hiring and bringing a lot of those students um, in from South Dakota School of Mines and sur surrounding schools as well. Western Dakota. Yep. yep. Or Western Dakota. Yep. Yes, sir. So, any thoughts about extending uh, that Minnesota notification, like to the environmental problems, such as if you were in an area that had high concentrations of carbon monoxide? Oh, like air detection? Yeah. So I would say at this point in time, that's that's not available. Um, but kind of in a nutshell, I look at uh, MindStar, that's that's the data collector, right? Yeah. And so if, if you can output from your air monitoring equipment the right signal, MindStar will track it for you. So uh, don't have it today, uh, but it sure could in the future. So again, it comes back to what you're able to get through the network, right? Yep. So it's all about communications, and this allows communications, just like we're doing in our cars, um, allows that same level of communication throughout the in entire operation down underground. All right, so we're at seven. I still feel like some people have some questions. We're going to go ahead and wrap up, but they do have the detect system set up out in the exhibit hall, so that's your opportunity to track them down. I think they'll still be giving out hats in the exhibit hall. Yeah, sure. yeah. Maybe, go get you your hat. Question. Ask your questions. You always guys are going to be here all night. Um, can we give give these guys a round of applause, please? Thank you.